In this tutorial, we're going to have a look at binomial hypothesis testing. Now, it's one of those topics that everybody's convinced that it's rock hard, but actually, it's so easy to get marks in if you follow all the steps I'm about to show you. Before we do anything, however, let's have a look at the question and try and suss out what it's actually asking us. So it says 55% of the pupils in a large school are girls. A member of the student council claims that the probability that a girl rather than a boy becomes head student is greater than 0.55. As evidence for his claims, he says that six out of the last eight head students have been girls. Use an exact binomial distribution to test the claim at the 10% significance level. Right, so if there was truly an equal chance of boys and girls, individual boys and girls becoming a head student, then we'd expect, because 55% of the students are girls, we'd expect that around about 55% of them would become head student. Likewise, there's 45% boys, so over the years you'd expect that 45% of boys become a head student. However, what they're claiming here is the probability of a girl becoming a head student is greater than 0.55, i.e. it's more likely that girls are going to become head student. Girls are better at becoming head student than boys proportionally. So basically, what we expect, since the 55% of the pupils in a large school are girls, we expect over the years 55% of them to become head student. So that's, that's our expectation. That's our, if you like, what we're going to discover are null hypotheses. Someone else has claimed as an alternative hypothesis, they've challenged the null hypothesis. They've said, well, actually, girls are better than boys at becoming head student. So I reckon, actually, the proportion of girls becoming head student is actually going to be more than 55%. And in this question, that's the argument that we're trying to settle. So in order to get marks in these hypothesis tests, you need to do all of these things that I'm about to write down. So step one is define the parameter P that we are testing for. So anything I write in red here is going to be worth marks. So P is the probability a girl will become head student. And that in an exam is usually worth a mark. So I'm just going to put a tick next to it to remind you you've got to write that. If you don't write this, you usually don't get the mark. Step two. State null and alternate hypotheses in terms of P. And that's the same P that we're testing for, that we defined in red above. So our null hypothesis is our initial assumption of what P is. That then gets challenged, and that would be called our alternate hypothesis. So our initial assumption of what P is was 0.55. So that says H0 colon P equals 0.55. So our null hypothesis, which we call H0, then a colon, then state what the hypothesis is. And there's no, really, there's no other acceptable way that you can write that. That has to be written like that. H0 colon, then our initial assumption of what the parameter is. The claim was then challenged. Someone says that it's actually greater than 0.55. So our alternate hypothesis, which we always call H1, colon, P is greater than 0.55. Again, always has to be written like that. Some of the most common mistakes that, we, uh, that students make, which I'll write down now, and I'll cross them out in just a short while. 
So sum right h0 equals 0 0.55, no marks. Sum right h0 equals p equals 0 0.55. Debatable, but probably no marks. It's still not right. Again, it's so important that you write it exactly the way I showed you because that's the only way you're going to get marks. So let's actually delete those. We don't want to see those. And in an exam, usually, not always, but usually, a mark for each of those hypotheses. So we're actually up to three marks now for what I've written in red, for having done no maths yet. Again, these are quite easy questions to get lots of marks in without doing any maths. Obviously, we want you to get all the marks, but just doing this gets you some. So step three. Use the data given. to test the value of P. Now this, I think, is the most complicated step to understand. So to help us understand, let's think of this analogy here. So we've all got a friend who tells a few lies, makes some bold claims. If this friend, let's say 16 to 18 years old, says that he's got five grand in the bank. For a 16 to 18 year old, that's a bit unlikely, but is it unlikely enough for you to call him out as a liar? Probably not. If that claim goes up to 10 grand, more likely to call him out on it. I'd still say, probably not. However, if this friend then goes on to claim that he's got a million pound in the bank, that story is so unlikely that you can, with almost certainty, now say, no, shut up, you're a liar. And the same analogy applies here. We're expecting 55% of the previous head students to have been girls. So we've tested eight students. It says there, eight head students we've tested. So eight times 55%. We'd expect 4.4 of them to have been girls. However, of the last eight head students, six were girls. That's bigger than 4.4, but is it big enough to say with enough certainty, i.e. 90% certainty or 10% uncertainty, that's the significance level, 10%. So we want to be 90% certain or 10% uncertain. Is it enough evidence that six of the last eight head students were girls? Is that far enough from 4.4? To help understand this, it helps to think of probability as being on a sliding scale. Now what we want, we're testing the top end of the scale because we want greater than or equal to so let's say that 4.4 is roughly in the middle of this scale. So let's put 4.4 there. So something that deviates significantly from 4.4, i.e. lies in this top 10%, will lead us to reject the null hypothesis. Anything that's less likely than 10% to have happened will lead to a rejection. So what we're going to try and do is see the amount of probability to the right of our observed value. Now anything in this region of less than 10% because that's our significance level gets rejected. So we want to see where our observed value from our experiment, so our observed value was 6. So there's six there. And we want to see where in this sliding scale of probability six lies. If it lies in this region or outside of this region. So I'll put it there for now. And the best way to see where six lies is to do the probability that x is greater than or equal to six. So see how much probability is to the right of 6. 
because we're testing for an increase, we test to the right, equals, from before, 1 minus the probability x is less than or equal to 5. And let's work that out on the calculator. So binomial cumulative distribution, variable, x is less than or equal to 5. The number of trials was 8, and it was 0 0.55. So 1 minus 0 0.7799 equals 1 minus 0 0.7799. And we'll do 1 minus that to get 0 0.220. 0 0.220. So 0 0.220 of the probability lies to the right of 6. That means on this sliding scale, 6 is well outside of the 10% region. It's actually, if 22% of the probability lies to the right of 6, 6 has been pushed out of this region. Therefore, we're not going to reject it. So this here is the rejection region. And we can see because... 22% of the probability lies to the right of 6, that it must have been pushed outside of this rejection region. By the way, this is a mark here for calculating that probability. Okay, moving on. Step 4. Compare to significance level. So 0 0.220 is greater than 0 0.1, 10%, which was our significance level. So it was more likely than our threshold. If it was less likely, we'd have rejected. We're setting 10% as our likelihood, after which we say, no, you're lying. So their story is more far-fetched, i.e. less likely than 10%. We reject. This one was more likely, which... It still gives evidence to suggest there's an increase, but not enough. We wanted to be 90% certain. We wanted their story to be less than 10% likely, which it isn't. So that's a mark. And our final step is to conclude in context. Conclude in context. So the first thing, we decide whether to reject H0 or not reject H0. Here, we weren't in the rejection region, so we're not going to reject H0. So I'm going to write do not reject H0. That's a mark. Never write accept H1 or reject H1 or anything in terms of H1. Always write the null hypothesis, always write the conclusion in terms of H0. It's H0 that's on trial, H0 that we're disputing. So we must do the conclusion in terms of H0. So we do not reject H0. And we have insufficient evidence evidence to suggest that the proportion of head girls is above 55%. So an in-context conclusion. And there we have it. Hypothesis tests, all seven marks gained. Then just for fun, part two. A statistics teacher says that considering only the last eight head students may not be satisfactory, explain what needs to be assumed about the data for the test to be valid. The sample of head students is random. It must be a random sample 
in order for the uh, test to be valid. The sample head students is random. Now I'm going to put the PDF of this available online on my website, alevelmathsrevision.com. Quite a complicated topic, so there are lots of lesson notes on this on there, so you maybe want to have a look at that. So for more videos like this, go to alevelmathsrevision.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you like this video, please click the thumbs up.